This Filmmaker IQ lesson is proudly sponsored by Rode Microphones, premium microphones and audio accessories for studio, live, and location recording. Hi, John Hess from FilmmakerIQ.com, and today we'll get into the post-production side of audio, establishing fundamentals and looking at the digital audio workstation tools for mixing and perfecting your film's soundtrack. In this lesson, we are going to be diving deep into shaping sound. So it's important that you have a fair grasp of the different aspects of sound. You may want to review, if you haven't already, our video on the science and engineering of sound, as we will be using many of the terms laid out in that lesson. Now for this lesson, I will be demonstrating with the tools that are inside Adobe Creative Cloud, including Premiere Pro and Audition. Now, all the tools I mentioned here should be available in other audio editing programs, and many may be included in your NLE of choice. The first tool or weapon in the sound editor's arsenal is the equalizer. But what exactly is an equalizer? Well, in real basic terms, an equalizer boosts or cuts the amplitude of certain frequencies, which alters the harmonics or overtones, resulting in the change of the character of the sound. So let's imagine the audio response of a wave as a straight line on a graph, where the x-axis represents the frequency going from low to high, and the y-axis represents amplitude. Now let's say we want to boost only the high frequency, say everything above 5,000 hertz. Our straight line is now broken into two levels with a slope in between. This is called a high shelf. This type of equalization called a first order filter is the simplest kind of equalization to perform using electronic components. And this is found on your basic consumer hi-fi systems. Now to continue, let's say we want to cut the sound of the low frequencies in our recording below 100 hertz. Our line reflects that with a low shelf cut. Now if we go into the extreme and eliminate all the sounds from above or below a certain frequencies, the shelf is now called a pass filter. A high pass filter essentially lets all the high frequencies pass, eliminating all the low range. Whereas a low pass filter does the opposite, lets all the low range pass and killing off all the high frequencies. But what if we want to target a more specific range of frequencies? Well, that's where a second order filter comes in. This is called a peaking filter or a parametric equalizer and has three settings. The frequency, which is what frequency you want to target, the gain, how much you want to boost or cut that frequency, and the Q or quality factor, which is how wide the parabola of the adjustment will be. High Q values will have a steeper slope. Now, sometimes Q is expressed in octaves. The more octaves a Q has, the wider and gentler the effect. A really high Q filter is used to completely eliminate a particular frequency is sometimes called a notch cut or a band stop filter. Now, this is used to eliminate constant frequency-based noise like electronic hum or to prevent feedback in a live audio setting. Another type of equalizer you may come across are graphic equalizers. Now, these are commonly found on mix boards. They behave the same way as parametric equalizers, except of in selecting specific frequencies and changing the Q values, all the frequencies are present as sliders with predetermined intervals and Q values. So how and why do we use equalizers? Well, there are essentially three main uses. First is to fix inadequacies in the recording. Microphones aren't perfect, and some have specific frequency response, and you may want to use the equalizer to compensate for a flatter response. You can also target specific hums with a notch filter and eliminate them, or use the high pass filter to cut low range rumble caused by, say, wind noise. The second use is when you're mixing audio sources and they are, they are competing in a similar frequency space. A common occurrence when mixing voiceover with background music. Now, if you cut the background music in the 1200 hertz range, the sweet spot of human voice, you can make some more room for dialogue or voiceover tracks. The final reason, and arguably the most important use of EQ, is for creative reasons, just to make this track sound better or maybe just different. For instance, boosting the bass frequencies on a dialogue track, say around 160 hertz, will add power to the human voice, but too much and you can make the track sound muddy and unintelligible. 
You can add a bit of presence by boosting the five kilohertz range, but again, too much will cause ear fatigue. The sibilance or S sounds can be found between four and 10 kilohertz. You can boost this for a little bit more clear sound or cut it to get rid of the harsh S sounds. Playing with these different EQ settings will get you closer to your desired sound. And if you're mixing instruments, there are many charts available online that give you a general guideline for which frequencies to target depending on the instrument. You can even go further and push EQ to create brand new sounds. For instance, EQ can be used to simulate the sound coming from a radio or a walkie-talkie. Houston, I think we have an EQ problem. In music, dynamics refers to the general loudness of a passage from piano, which is soft, to fortissimo, which is loud and forceful. A dynamics in sound engineering is the same concept. The dynamic range is the difference between the very soft and the very loud. Now, sometimes we need to compress that range to make that difference between soft and loud passages smaller. This is the work of a tool called the compressor. To visualize what a compressor does, let's use, what else, a graph. On the x-axis, we'll put our input level in decibels, and on our y-axis will be our output level. Now, if we don't apply any compression at all, we have a straight line curve going 45 degrees up the chart with a slope of one. For any given input, the output will be exactly the same. A compressor works by essentially squashing down the sound that goes above a certain threshold. Let's say we want to dampen everything that goes above negative 12 dB. A compressor essentially draws a new line starting at negative 12 dB, this time with a, sl a slope of say one half or two to one compression. This means for every two decibel increase in volume above negative 12 dB from the input, there will only be one dB increase in the output volume. A more drastic compression will be four to one. For each four decibel increase in the input, there would only be one decibel increase in the output. Uh, compressors have settings for attack and release and to determine how quickly or slowly they kick in. Too fast and you can get a pumping sound. Too slow and spikes in the audio can slip right through. Now, once we have compressed the dynamic range, we can now safely boost the entire track to make everything generally sound louder if desired. Now, if you push the slope flatter than say 20 to one or 100 to one, you get what's called a limiter. A limiter essentially prevents peaks from going over a specific target, generally used for broadcasts as they have very short attack and release times. The opposite of a compressor is called, as you might imagine, an expander. Now going back to our curve, an expander is part of the curve that has a slope of greater than one. Well, let's say we want the audio that is below negative 20 dB to get quieter faster. Our curve reflects us with a steeper slope. Expanders are generally only used for the quieter parts of the dynamic range. A noise gate is one kind of expander. A noise gate essentially is like a high pass filter except for amplitude. Anything louder than a threshold will get through. Anything lower than the threshold will be expanded down into nothing. Attack and release settings are available for expanders as well and they need to be tinkered with to find the best settings. So why would we want to use a compressor? Well, compressors help smooth out sudden increases in volume caused by momentary changes of distance from the mic or just natural changes in the volume. Smaller dynamic ranges may be necessary for your venue. If you're mixing audio for video that's gonna be shown on the floor of a subway station, well, there's gonna be a lot of ambient noise and you wanna boost those soft parts in order to compete with that ambient noise which gets us to one of the main uses of compression, to make the audio sound more powerful and louder than it really is. Over the years, the recording industry has moved towards making their albums sound as loud as possible. Compare the waveforms from this recording from the 70s and a modern song. It just shows how much compression is used these days. Well, that's not always a bad thing as people often listen to music in their cars or on earbuds where it's important to keep a consistent level while still having that feeling of loudness. A really handy tool for bringing out more life and audio track is the multi-band compressor. 
Now, multiband compressor essentially combines the best of EQ, the control of harmonics and overtones, with the control of dynamic range that a compressor has. A multi-band compressor essentially breaks the track into different bands of frequencies which you can independently apply compression. For example, on voice tracks, you can compress and boost that 160 hertz range for added power while leaving everything else alone. Now, most programs will have several presets to pick from and I almost always find myself reaching for the multi-band compressor when I'm finishing my mixes. Expanders can be used as noise gates, which can push our noise floor lower, but there's another technique in the digital realm for eliminating noise called the Fast Fourier Transform, or FFT. Now, inside Adobe Audition, FFT is a standalone filter or part of their noise reduction suite, and it works by first taking a snapshot of the noise creating a profile of that noise and then using various settings, subtracting that noise from the entire track. Now, the problem with FFT processing is too much can result in something called chirping, which is squirrely weird digital bird sounds. Now, you can avoid chirping by not completely removing the background noise, and to my ears, a little bit of ambient noise is not necessarily unwanted as it can give a little warmth to a track. But FFT isn't only used for noise reduction, as you can use it to remove practically any sound, from car horns to footsteps to instrument hits. There are a lot of neat and amazing things that can be done with FFT. And now we get into probably the most fun filters, certainly the ones that I tried out first as a kid when I was playing with digital audio programs. Uh, using a delay filter, we, create, we can create some really interesting effects. By repeating the audio with a delay of 15 milliseconds or less, we get an effect called combing, where the interference pattern created by the delay resemble that of a comb. Now, combing is generally avoided in the recording stage. It's caused by quick, slappy echo but as an effect, it may be able to add something unique and interesting to the mix, it's up to your ears. With a delay of 15 to 35 milliseconds, we start getting chorusing effects, where the brain is starting to perceive more than one voice or instrument being sounded. Chorusing filters also can vary the pitch and timings of the delays for even more effects. Now this may be useful for creating bizarre and otherworldly characters for your audio. Beyond 35 milliseconds, then we begin to perceive a distinct echo effect. Along with echo are reverb filters. Instead of being a direct delayed copy, reverb is a mixture of a large number of random and decaying echoes. Advanced digital reverb generators can even simulate the time and frequency response of specific rooms like concert halls. Echo and reverb give your audio track a sense of space, whether that's in a large cavern, or in a small, hard tile room. Now, if we take a wave and we squeeze the time, we are by very essence adjusting the frequency. Make the time shorter and the frequency will go up. Stretch it out and the frequency will go down. Now, this is the most basic form of pitch shifting and it's sometimes linked with the chipmunk effect, where the original songs were sung at half the speed and an octave below and then played back at twice the speed. But say you want to change the time of the track without changing the pitch or vice versa. To do this, audio programs use either phase vocoders or sinusoidal spectral modeling to stretch and squish waveforms, making things like auto-tune possible. Uh, these essentially model the new desired sound frequencies using rather complicated math, which we'll just leave for the audio engineers and programmers. Wow, we have just barely scratched the surface of what goes into audio engineering and sound design. But the whole purpose of this lesson has been to provide some fundamental groundwork from EQ, dynamics, noise reduction, and time and pitch effects. I hope this has cleared up some of the mystery of working with post audio. But no filmmaker, no sound mixer, or any artist working in any medium can simply watch a video and take a class and suddenly become top of the field. It takes practice, practice, practice. In the case of audio mixing, a lot of time just fiddling with those knobs and buttons and experimenting with how this sounds when you boost this range or cut that frequency. Experiment, play, and repeat. If it sounds good and you have a decent pair of speakers, then it is good.
Don't be afraid to try new things and fail because it's all on the path to making something great. I'm John Hess. I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com.